Welcome to the show, everybody. Today, we've uh, got a very special guest on here, one I'm very excited about. Uh, we've got Jeremy Patzer, the MP for the uh, Cypress Hills region here. And uh, he's going to be talking about a few different things that are big to, for Canada here right now, as well as the uh, throne speech, since that went on today. We're going to get a, a fresh take on that one. And uh, without further ado, yeah, here's Jeremy. Let's uh, let him introduce himself here. Tell me about yourself, family interests, that kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I'm Jeremy Patzer, Member of Parliament, Cypress Hills Grasslands. For uh, just a quick snapshot of the size of the area it covers, it goes from the American border all the way north to Kindersley, goes from the Alberta border to about just past Carinport on the number one highway. Uh, it covers off an area roughly 77,000 square kilometers in size, so it's a pretty sizable area. Uh, family, yeah, so I, I'm married. My wife and I have three kids. We've got a son and two daughters, and they're uh, they're all three in school now, so it's a uh, it's uh, it's a fun stage of life to be in, and they're quite uh, quite active kids. So I mean, adjusting to the what's been going on this summer has been you know a bit of challenge with kids for sure, but kids they adapt very easily. So it's uh, yeah, but they're great and uh, yeah. Yeah, kids seem to handle these things way better than we do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when did you first get into politics, and what made you uh, decide to get into politics? Yeah, for sure. You know, my uncle was a uh, was elected as a member of parliament uh, when I was 13. So naturally, that got me interested in, in politics at a younger age. Um, more recently, yeah. So, though, you know, so yeah, I always follow politics closely. But when I, about five, six years ago, I got a, a lot more interested and motivated to get involved, right? So that led me to join the, uh, the, the Conservative Riding Association in Cypress Hills Grasslands. Uh, so I got involved that way. Um, yeah, and, and growing up, I helped uh, helped David campaign a little bit, and helped doing some signs and different things like that per se as well too. Um, yeah, and then in Swift Current, just doing some local stuff, just you know being involved with the uh, Minor Baseball Association, uh, the uh, Community Cooperative Preschool Association as well. So just some small boards like that throughout the uh, the city of Swift Current. Uh, yeah, definitely you know helped gain a, a, a good perspective required, I think, to, to serve in public life. Yeah, David Anderson, he's uh, definitely a good family friend. Uh, I've always enjoyed talking to him. Um, what are some key issues that uh, you would like to see addressed in Canada going forward? Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, you know, if we're going to have this conversation outside of the realm of, of, of COVID, just for that sake, yep. per se, right? Um, you know, national unity is definitely a, a big hot-button topic, for sure. Um, you know, we... Well, one of the, the, the beauties of Canada is we have a lot of different regions per se, right? But, you know, right now we don't have all those regions of the country um, being given the same opportunity to, to participate in either the economic uh, growth of the country or the driver of, of our jobs, right? So, I mean, we look in Western Canada the way that our oil and gas sector has been treated by this government for the past five years and, and also the impacts that some of those decisions have had on our farmers as well. Um, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty for manufacturers, even just you know for our, our mining industry, for um, for manufacturing. There's a there's a whole litany of issues that have arisen just based on the policies that the current government has chose uh, to implement and to continue to run forward on, and uh, it, it continues to prevent and further investment into Canada into our sectors that have carried our our country for a number of years, in particular the the last crash that happened back in 2009. You know, it was our, our resource-based sector that really carried the country through. Um, so we need to make sure that that is being uh, being addressed. So, and I think that if we can address those those, those issues, it's going to help uh, with the uh, with, with the national unity issues that we have as well, too. Yeah, I know we see the rise of the WEX at now Maverick Party, and uh, a lot of those kind of separation parties popping up all over the place now in, in Alberta, especially. So definitely, I think you hit the nail on the head there. That's that's definitely a big a big issue for us going forward. Um, kind of changing tracks a little bit to the um, things we've been seeing throughout Trudeau's whole uh, both terms here, uh, and that it would be like his ethics violations. I know we've got we've got three really that he's been dinged for, but I, I'm sure there's many more that we could be including in there, and there's more coming to light all the time. Um, what are your thoughts on these, and um, what are your thoughts on the fact that the RCMP hasn't really looked too far into these into these ethics violations or made any arrests? Yeah, so I mean, the big thing is, 
you know, I think all of our public, publicly elected officials, we need to be held to the highest possible standard that we possibly can, and we're not seeing that happening. Um, so that's creating a lot of a lot of frustration. So I'm encouraged by the work that the ethics committee has done, you know, to bring light to a lot of the a lot of the scandal, a lot of the issues, whether it was the SNC Lavalin issue or now with the Wee Charity scandal. Um, a lot of those things are they continue to be brought to the to the limelight by the ethics committee, by the conservative members on it, and even some of the other parties are really uh, gaining steam and traction on that as well. Certainly, Charlie Angus from the NDP has has joined. Uh, forces more or less with the conservative members to really hold the government uh, to try to hold the government accountable to the decisions that they've been making. Uh, it's kind of a tricky part as far as getting, you know, why hasn't there been any any arrest made or why aren't the RCP doing things? And, and really, ultimately, it really boils down to, you know, again, you know, as much as we don't like it and the ethics violations are, they drive a lot of us crazy, right? But there's not an actual you know, pick, pick something that he is criminally can be charged with within the criminal code in and of itself. It doesn't necessarily exist. Um, it's really frustrating and it, it really drives a lot of Canadians crazy and bonkers because, I mean, again, accountability is a huge thing. And again, as a public official, we need to be held to that highest standard that we possibly can and that doesn't seem to be happening, right? But ultimately, um, yeah, we need to, you know, what law that's in, in, in Canadian law has officially been broken that he can officially be charged with per se, right? I mean, that that's kind of what it really boils down to. The RCMP has been asked to look into different things like that, you know, with different violations, but yeah, just looking to see what specific law could a person be charged with in these, in these cases. There, there isn't any precedent for that. Yeah, I know I've seen some people online trying to do citizens arrests and all that kind of stuff too. And I know a lot of that hasn't really turned out well. I didn't expect it to. But uh, yeah, that just kind of speaks to the frustration that, that you're that you're mentioning there. People are just, they're coming to a boiling point for sure in terms of that. Yeah. And I think that they need to uh, take it out on the polls is what they need to do. <laughs> well, that, that's exactly it, right? And that's why our committees are continuing to work hard to just keep bringing the details to the light so the public gets a chance to see exactly you know what's going on and, and what decisions that were made and, and how they either influenced this or influenced that or you know is this person benefited when when nobody else did right i mean those things you know as much as it drives a lot of us crazy it gets people really really frustrated those aren't criminal things right there but again it's it's ethics it's standards and and they're not being met and uh yeah, it's that's again that's the, the the part that really drives people crazy. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I know um, in terms of that too, like it's uh, Agus Khan is another one that we could throw in there. His big vacation, I know that's that's one I've heard a lot of people talking about too. And again, like you say, not really a criminal thing. It's more just a a, a dilemma in terms of <laughs> in terms of there. And and you bring up uh, the ethics committee and. I really like um, listening to Michelle Rempel Garner and um, and Pierre Polivier. They're really great in terms of their job. Uh, I'm glad we have them on the sh on the shadow cabinet there and have them help and look into this because definitely they're they're uh, real pit bulls that, that can uh, drive it home and and I look forward to seeing what they can uh, do now that Parliament is coming back. Um, and that kind of brings us to the next point here. Um, so Trudeau is claiming that he had prorogued Parliament to avoid a non-confidence vote, comparing it to what the Conservatives had done previously. But I do see a big difference between what the Conservatives did and what the Liberals did in terms of it. Um, basically because from the look of it, um, we see Parliament being prorogued by the Conservatives to do exactly what Trudeau had said they were they were trying to do, which was avoid a non-confidence. Um, you kind of can probably get where I'm leading with this, but what do you think the real reason for him proroguing Parliament is? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's it's <laughs> it's really easy to draw the conclusion that it's it's about the We Charity scandal and how just the way that everything was snowballing in our favor that way. And you look at the polls; he was going down. They prorogued Parliament. The investigation stopped. They slowly start to rebound a little bit in the polls, right? Um, that's really what it feels like like it was done for, right? And ultimately, if they wanted a confidence vote, all they had to do was table a budget, 
a budget is automatically a confidence vote. The government can make anything a confidence vote if it wants, right? You don't have to prorogue Parliament in order to initiate a confidence vote, right? And uh, if they wanted to do a, a throne speech to reset their mandate, they could have on Tuesday paroled Parliament and then Wednesday did the throne speech. They, there was no need for the for the long layover in between the time that they called it and the time that the throne speech happened, right? That it could have just been a, a quick turnaround from one to the other to just reset that mandate so they can give the throne speech again if they really wanted to, right? But ultimately, if they want a confidence vote, cable a budget, and that'd be the start of a, of a confidence vote right there. Yeah, instead it feels like a bit of a waste of time for for Canadians and uh, a delay in answers that people really, really want for these uh, violations that we've been speaking about here. And it just seemed yeah. like, like a way of hitting the little reset stop button, um, like in a game, hitting the little save point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so many think Trudeau is kind of trying to force an election. Um, I don't really have a strong opinion on, on, on that either way, but uh, it feels like he might have been trying to do so to um, keep the majority of people kind of on their toes and sweep it all underneath the rug in terms of these ethics violations. Um, what are your thoughts on whether or not he's actually trying to force an election? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts for that to happen, right? I mean, it's there's a, there are scenarios that could play out where he could do that. Um, there's... And again, we have the interesting configuration the way that we do it with the amount of parties that we have that are representing different people across the country, right? So as the opposition for the last while, people keep asking us, well, why aren't you guys forcing a confidence vote? Well, to force a confidence vote, you would need three different political parties to come together and be united on that, that front, right? Um, or the other parties could decide to leverage that to the government to try to get what they want from the government. And in some cases, that's happened. So there really isn't the... I would say the political will amongst all of the opposition parties previously to do that, right? Um, so I guess we'll, we'll wait and see when the, when the government decides to uh, table a budget. I think, and actually, I think next week we'll have a series of votes that would be considered confidence votes. Uh, so we'll see what happens uh, happens with those. So I know everyone is kind of tired of hearing about COVID. We'll kind of move over to that a little bit. I won't focus heavily on it because I know, like I say, everyone is tired of hearing about it. Um, how do you think that the government has handled the COVID situation so far? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to really just say that, you know, any government ever gets all these things perfect, right? I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, all the parties did work on getting a solution that, you know, worked better for Canadians in a lot of ways, right? The government would make an announcement on something. As opposition, we would either say, no, that's not going to work, and we would negotiate with them and, and work on it, and we would get a better deal for uh, Canadians. that would give them the support that they, they ultimately needed, right? So, I mean, um, yeah, like it's. I, I think all things considered, it hasn't been, initially, it wasn't too, too bad. You know, when we're looking at the, the deficit piling up, higher and higher, we look at the financial hole that we're digging into. Um, when we had the financial crisis in, in 09, Conservatives ran, they ran a big deficit, but they were able to rebound from it because the investments that they made by doing that had, were part of the plan to, to rebound and get things going again. By and large, Canada, we were able to balance the books in a matter of years, and we were able to uh, get the economy going. So those are things that we're looking for from the government now that, you know, these programs have happened, but what can be done now? What's the short-term plan? What's the medium-term plan? What's the long-term plan to try to get the economy rolling again now that these supports are either ending um, or they're looking to extend certain ones like we saw with, with parts of the throne speech. So, and I know it's it's easy to criticize because it's it's a novel virus. It's something we haven't really experienced before. It's, it's unique times for all of us. Um, so it is easy to, to kind of critique these things and say you know things could have been done better is there anything that you specifically would point out that maybe they should have done better yeah and i mean for sure with with hindsight always being 2020 right i mean we probably limiting travel would have been more advantageous like with the with the borders per se but you know the government was getting advice that shutting down the borders wasn't going to do any good anyway and then they completely changed position on that right so there's things like that that, you know, 
in hindsight, they could have done that differently. That would have worked. Um, you know, there's there's a few different supports that we we offered or we, we put out there as the opposition that we hey we think this would be good, such as a GST remittance to all businesses. That way, it wouldn't discriminate. You didn't have to qualify for anything. It was if you paid GST, you get your GST back, right? So there's some things like that that I think that we that could have been implemented that would have been uh, fair and equitable to all businesses and given everybody a chance to get the support that they needed in the short term, which would have been that cash flow to either keep their employees on the payroll or try to keep the doors open and not have to shut down as you know as it turned out that they had to. Uh, so there's a lot of there are a few other options that you know we recommended to the government that they didn't end up taking that we think would have helped. But you know that's definitely one that stands out. For sure. So one that I know. I have heard a lot of people talking about now, especially um, with kind of a second stage of the CERB um, being introduced. Um, so in terms of that, um, we see 16 year olds who are able to qualify for it. Um, and a lot of people don't feel that they should really be qualifying for it. Um, and now we see, you know, a second wave of it happening. And I've heard a lot of people saying that, you know, there's no point in my returning back to work because I make more money on the, on the CERB. What kind of things could they do maybe, um, in terms of that, uh, to, to address that, that issue and make it so it's people can't just abuse it. Well, first of all, it was brought to their attention that there was a lot of fraud happening and they said, that's fine. Just let it happen and we'll deal with it later. Right. So there already were some mechanisms in place for them to identify when when some of that was happening, and they chose to just ignore it. So, um, yeah, and ultimately, so I mean, we're still waiting for legislation on what the new government program will, will be. So there there's changes to EI and to to the CERB program to just be called the Canada Recovery Benefit. Uh, there is some guidelines for it online, but we haven't actually had a piece of legislation. Put in front of us to see how that's actually going to look like what it's going to roll out to be like so still waiting on that but um yeah it'll be interesting to see what they decide to do with that when we get a chance to review it so what how else do you think the government should maybe be handling this the whole covid thing um going forward in terms of um ways to for the even health wise for them to to kind of address it well Testing capacity continues to be one of the biggest things, right? There are other jurisdictions in the world that they have multiple rapid testing options available. And in Canada, we don't. We're still using the I think the nasal swab. And I think they're starting to do like a throat swab so you don't have to go all the way through the sinuses. Um, but up until now, it's just been through the nose with a big, big swab, right? It's, it's an uncomfortable, uncomfortable. Test. It takes time to get the result, right? So let's... You know, we need to have that testing capacity, but we all need to have that rapid test, right? Because, I mean, to be able to test and get your result within 30 minutes would be awesome or even quicker, right? I mean, there's 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 other jurisdictions around the world that are doing that. And um, so those are the things that we need to look at doing as a way to provide more certainty and clarity for people. And also just to see, uh, again, what's going to happen when, when, when the vaccine, when they start doing the testing on it, what what's that going to look like is a single dose enough. Johnson & Johnson is doing some testing right now on that to see. So ultimately to see what comes out of that, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to see you know, what they do with that. Yeah, that's a good point too uh, about the testing, especially because I know there's, I know people who are, they have to be off work for like a week because their kid or a relative that lives with them is waiting for test results. So they're not allowed to work until they get the results back. And it's a long time to wait. It really is when you're when you're waiting for those results and you're not not getting a call, although I've been told if they don't get a, give you a call within 48 hours, you're probably clear. But you need that confirmation to return to work. Um, yeah. Another thing that they're doing to handle it has been a lot of the masks, and we see a lot of mask mandates. Um, what is your party's position on the mask mandates? Um, and I know there's some exemptions and stuff that that come into play there as well. So what is your your guys' position on that? Well, ultimately, a lot of these are, are provincial decisions that are being made. So, you know, being a federal party, we're going to disrespect the provincial jurisdictions as they have the ability to make those decisions uh, for the for themselves and, and enforce them as as they see fit, right? So, it's not fitting for a federal party to try to to mingle in, into those provincial decisions that are being made. Um, but yeah, I mean, ultimately, it just we need to have respect for 
for the people around us, right? I mean, that, that's ultimately what it, what it boils down to. Why the masks are, are being recommended? Is it, it? It's just one of many tools to to help reduce the spread. It's not the be all. It's not the be all end all. But it, it's it does provide you know one option to try to help limit the spread a little bit. But it's one of many. Uh, things that are that are being used to try to help and limit it, but yeah, it's not ultimately what's gonna gonna stop COVID from from spreading. So we'll move on beyond that now. I think we focused on COVID enough here. What uh, <laughs> with the Indigenous reserves, and I know I have Métis in my background too. So for me, these kind of issues do do hold some weight, although I don't really. I'm not a card carrying Métis, but uh, our Indigenous reserves and non-reserve um, Indigenous have many struggles that they face um, in day-to-day life. How does your party plan to address some of these issues? I guess clean water is a big, a big issue going forward as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The clean, the, the clean drinking is, is a huge part of that, right? I mean, you know, in our last election campaign, we talked about eliminating, I think it was 40% of foreign dollars that we were, that the government was handing out. And, and, and part of the plan for that was, is we have these issues at home that are not being addressed. So how can we then be spending all this money on, on well, a lot of it is on vanity projects overseas, um, but we have people that can't get clean drinking water here, right? So, you know, those are some of the things, you know, especially in the House of Commons, we hear about it a lot, um, you know, about clean drinking water on First Nations. There's, there's housing issues for sure. The uh, you know the, and the the reconciliation issue is, is always going to be a big issue that we need to just continue to to listen and we need to you know formulate a real plan to actually to, to do that but that's going to you know revolve uh, you know around listening and uh, you know I look forward to seeing you know what we as a party what we're, what the plan that we're going to be able to put together going forward uh, what our new leadership team is going to do um, you know that's all you know. The path forward on that is yet to be determined and decided, but you know there's going to be a lot of a lot of listening and consultation that's definitely going to have to happen for sure. But yeah, the clean drinking water issue is definitely a, a very strong one that needs to be dealt with, and it should be dealt with, you know, now, right? Yeah, I know in the past I, I've heard from people who uh, do live on reserves, um, and I've heard this from a few different people who live on reserves. They say that um, they were initially given money for clean drinking water, and then some of the chiefs uh, decided that they wanted to use that money in other areas like uh, casinos or whatever, or other projects that they themselves are pet projects, rather than the clean drinking water, so they're still left with dirty drinking water. So one of the issues that they kind of brought up to me was that they would like a little bit more accountability with chiefs, I don't know how, from a federal level, we can kind of go about doing that. Um, but are, do you have any thoughts on maybe ways we can maybe address that accountability the, of spending? Well, I mean, the Conservative Party did have the Transparency Act put in place for that spending, and uh, honestly, there were a ton of um, uh, First Nations members that said, "Hey, you know what? This is." great that you have done this because we are frustrated because we've seen that you know and a lot of people are saying what you just said where you know we got money for that but it wasn't used for that why right so we had that measure um that got repealed by the the government in 2015 is one of the very first things that they did was repeal that transparency act um so i, I think that's you know that would definitely be, be part of the process i think going forward just to make sure that that accountability measure is there because ultimately um, yeah, you know, the First Nations people wanted that in there. They said that that was something that they really appreciated because it gave them clarity and it gave them a sense of, you know, what what was going on locally for them. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's basically what they, they've been saying to me exactly. Um, so good point. Um, on another kind of hot button issue right now, especially with everything going on down in the U.S., we see uh, tensions with China escalating. I mean, we've got... Um, espionage through the Huawei um, as well as through um, TikTok. Uh, so we're seeing them banned in a lot of countries, uh, especially the U.S. And uh, we're also seeing uh, them trying to take over their old borders in the South China Sea that they haven't had for centuries. So they're threatening other countries. 
uh, who are all around that area, as well as bringing in concentration camps. So, I mean, right now there's tension between uh, Australia, the Philippines, the U.S., India, Taiwan, Thailand, Beijing, like all these different nations and China. Um, what are your thoughts on the whole China situation? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, we look at the, you know, what, what's going on in Hong Kong, right? We got to support, we need to support democracy there. Uh, I, I've, I've signed on to a few different uh, letters of support for Hong Kong for, for their democracy, for the pro-democracy groups that are there because they are being arrested and detained uh, for, for trying to uh, support democracy, right? So, you know, as a, as a free and democratic country in Canada, we need to make sure that we are supporting other democracies around the world that are fighting for the right to remain a free and democratic society. Um, and yeah, I mean, the situation with, you know, with, with the Uyghurs, you know, being put into these concentration camps, you know, those are things that has the opposition. We've been calling on the government to take a stance on that. Uh, there's this, the Canada-China special committee that's been struck up as well. Uh, and ultimately, too, when we look at, you know, uh, Michael Colbrig, Michael Spaver, we need to ensure that these these men can get back home to Canada as soon as possible, right? It, it's already been way too long that they have been been arrested and illegally detained in China, so that needs to stop. Our, again, the government, we're going to continue to call on the government to take action on that front as well. Yeah, China prison is nowhere you want to be. <laughs> Some of the worst prisons in the world. Um, so in terms of Huawei and their they're kind of using that kind of as as espionage and I know some of their officials were arrested here one of them in particular in uh, in Canada do you think that they should be banned due to the espionage risks Yeah I mean our, our party's official position on that is that Huawei uh, should be banned and you look at the decisions that have been made by many of the the big telco players in Canada they've all decided to to ban Huawei from their 5G deployment. And some of them had already made the decision to go with Huawei and they changed course, right? Um, so I, I think it's great that, you know, the, the companies have taken the time to, to really consider that themselves and, and make that decision. But as a conservative party, we, we have the position that, yeah, it needs to be that Huawei should be banned from any 5G deployment going forward. Yeah, and for Saskatchewan viewers here, uh, I know Sastel had planned to use that and then when all this kind of came out they just, they made the decision not to not to use that on their towers which tell us and all them use our towers in in saskatchewan here too through sastel so i know that's one one big thing for for that rogers i'm not sure i, I don't know about about their side of things but i know for sure the sask party was talking about huawei and uh sastel um yeah. Do you think China should be allowed to be purchasing some of the beachheads that we're seeing them purchase um, through purchasing Canadian businesses uh, up north, especially they're doing this um, and they're replacing some of our employees with their own Chinese labor forces because they can do it cheaper. So it's kind of threatening our jobs. It's threatening our national security. What is the conservative stance on them being allowed to do this? Yeah, I mean, we've been looking into a lot of the, just some of the foreign direct investment is to kind of see if there are some security threats and issues with that, right? Uh, there was conversations in, in various committees on the industry committee that I served on. We had that conversation um, briefly with, with a few different groups as well to just, you know, get a sense of where we were at as a nation with some of that stuff and if there were some concerns and some issues with that. Um, yeah, so I mean, again, ultimately, it's when, when you have an adversarial trade relationship with somebody, you know, there, there's that fine line between having a trading relationship, but also, you know, looking at some of the, the human rights issues that are, that are going on for sure. And we need to see, you know, what is the best outcome for Canadians by, by doing this, right? So um, I, th I think we need to take it, you know, case by case and see see what's going on and make a dis big decisions from there. But you know, ultimately, it's up to this current government to decide what they're going to do with those situations and uh, and and make a call on them. And they're mostly mostly quiet on that front. <laughs> Eerily quiet. Eerily. <laughs> yeah. Um, another issue with China that has been uh, really kind of been around for for years and i know i'd spoken to your uncle a little bit about this as, as well um the canadians and americans i know we they always ship all their business production over to china it's cheaper um they can get 
product out cheaper but in the end it's really kind of hurt our economy and it's set us up now for failure in terms of our economy and our labor force it's taken all those jobs away from our labor force um, what are are your thoughts on maybe giving tax incentives for companies to stay in Canada and produce in Canada rather than shipping all their their production over to China yeah, you know, I think there needs to be a lot of things that we that we look at for sure, right? I mean, and tax incentives, you know, you know, they definitely work. They're one of the best ways to actually, again, get that investment back in Canada, right? Uh, having talked to a lot of people involved in manufacturing and different things, one of the, and even just in our committee work, a lot of some of the things that we've been talking about is um, how do we get value added production in happening in Canada, right? You know, for the most part, Canada exports raw and we import refined right so what are some we need to identify what are some of the products what are some of the things that we can maybe manufacture here and uh, as opposed to yeah outsourcing that and yeah it would bring jobs it would bring investment and it would bring uh you know even it's just the r d dollars that would come along with it too so there is there's a lot of potential there and those are some of the conversations that are happening you know within the within uh you know the federal committees that are you know that we're sitting before prorogation and will be you know, resuming here in, in a few weeks. Um, those are some of the discussions that we're having is to see what that looks like and, and what the Canada strategy should be. Again, we need the government to come up with a short-term, medium-term, long-term vision for how do we kickstart the economy? How do we grow the economy? How do we get jobs back in Canada? There's still uh, there's still millions of people unemployed because of what, what recently happened with, with COVID and with, with the lockdowns, right? Uh, so we need to get people working. We need to provide opportunity. We also need to provide growth for the economy. And that's one area for sure that that could happen. Yeah, for sure. Uh, another industry that kind of has been hit hard lately would be the oil industry and our farmers. Um, as a result of that, then you hit the construction. It kind of just kind of snowballs down. Um, and a lot of that is due to liberal attacks on these industries in particular. Um, especially industries that the West needs in order to succeed or has used in the past to succeed. Saskatchewan has kind of diversified a lot in terms of that. Um, so we haven't been hit quite as hard, but I know the uh, we've just seen a lot of, of, of those attacks coming from the Liberals, and I didn't see anything addressed today either on that. Um, what are your thoughts on these attacks on our Western civilization and Western industry yeah and I mean I think we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier as far as the national unity issue right and uh, you know just recognizing that these are the, the industries that drive the economy of not just Western Canada but all of Canada right um, for the amount of uh, uh, there's there's some great studies and great statistics out there that just support you know you know how, how what's the trickle-down effect when it comes to jobs for, for dollars spent in resource development for dollars spent in agriculture, right? Um, so the more that these policies cripple these industries, it's not only negatively impacting the immediate areas of Saskatchewan and Alberta, but it has that big impact in, in Ontario and in Quebec, out in the Maritimes as well. I mean, there, there's a huge ripple effect through the entire economy. So we need to support, again, what different regions of the country do well. You know, Southern Ontario manufacturing is, is a big part of what they do there. Um, so it makes sense to, to support manufacturing in, in, that, in that regard. We also have good manufacturing out in Western Canada. We have the resource development in, in uh, Western Canada as well. So let, let, let's support what we do there. The government doesn't do that though, right? I mean, they have their agenda and they're driving forward with that. And uh, it, it seems the key things that support the Western way of life are being squashed by an ideologically driven um, mandate. Yeah, I know there's a lot of uh, employees who used to work from the maritime provinces. They've all headed home and without jobs because there just isn't the work here anymore that they used to be able to, to do. So you're right, like it, it affects the whole country. Um, another thing that kind of has been used to kind of what the Westerners feel targets their industries would be the carbon tax. Um, and I know this is another big hot button issue right now, especially with Trudeau talking about possibly doubling down on on the carbon tax and adding another one in there. Um, so, what are your thoughts on the on the carbon tax, and would the Conservatives consider removing the carbon tax completely? 
Yeah, absolutely. We, we fully support fully eliminating the carbon tax, you know, full stop, end, right there. Um, you know, we, but we know the Liberal government, they're going to, like you said, they're looking to double down on that with the clean fuel standard. We're still waiting to see what the full regulations are going to look like. Basically, those are going to be released this fall. They haven't given a, a firm timeline for when that's going to happen, but um, that's something that they're really looking, looking to do as part of their uh, green recovery going forward. Um, there will be another carbon tax increase happening in uh, in the new year as well. Like we did, we saw that this last, you know, January there was a carbon tax increase. Um, that's going to happen again, and you know they previously indicated it's going to go up to fifty dollars a ton, so it, it, it's still got room room to grow based on what the Liberals are saying. But as Conservatives, we don't support it at all. It needs to go. So. Kind of along that same line, it's kind of the perfect segue into the throne speech we had today. Um, as we've kind of indicated about different changes that could be coming up, what it looked like when I was watching it was that it really just lacked substance. You know, it was felt like a big waste of time, a big waste of taxpayer dollars. Um, and Trudeau made such a big build up about it, only for it to be a big nothing and uh, or as Michelle Rumpel Garner would put it a big nothing burger um, and uh, it's a perfect sum summarization to me of, of uh, what it was um, so could you summarize kind of what the governor general outlined for all of us viewers here well a lot of what was was read today was just recycled from the last throne speech right I mean a lot of it was things that they they didn't do so they just they just recommitted it right there's a lot of recommitments in in this throne speech for sure um there's a few things you know they've, they've talked about pharmacare for a number number of years so that's another uh another issue that they, they they brought in there they they kept bringing it up in there um the uh uh they're looking at a uh, a national child care strategy as well, which I mean, again, you're, you're looking into some provincial issues. One of the one of the things that really listening to that whole throne speech, there was a lot of provincial issues that they said that they were going to address and that they were going to deal with. And we don't need a heavy-handed approach from the federal government on provincial matters. We need to let the provinces have the room to operate as they see fit, right? And uh, there's again. Some of the things that they're talking about in the throne speech were about getting heavy handed on the provinces and that's you know well, ultimately I think a lot of Canadians will see that and, and think that that's that's not acceptable that's not good right there's different jurisdictions that I, we we respect and that we follow uh, we there's things that the federal government deals with there's things the provinces deal with and the federal government should not be again taking that heavy handed approach at the provinces this throne speech is pretty heavy on, on those areas. Yeah, I know a lot of the talking points in there, kind of along what you, along to what you were saying, seemed like partisan talking points, and more like a campaign speech, uh, is what it seemed seem more like. And uh, to me, that wasn't the place for a governor general. It wasn't something that that you get a governor general to do. You don't get her to make your campaign speeches for you. Um, was there anything brought up in that uh, throne speech that the Conservative Party wouldn't support? Uh, wouldn't support? Would not support. Would not support, yeah. Well, I mean, ultimately we're voting no to the throne speech. We're not going to accept it as, as it is, right? So, um, yeah, there's a whole lot in there that we, we just, we can't support, right? So, Is there yeah. anything in there that you would support? Uh, one thing that was, there was some language in there about um, when it came to, uh, make, sure, figure out, make sure I say this right, but about getting access to, for for drugs you know i'm just going to use the example of trikafta right they didn't specifically say trikafta but it would be a, a framework around that so that's one area for for optimism for sure because they're you know that's within the, the purview of the federal government and their the approvals and regulatory process for that um so we'll we'll see what comes of that um that, that, that's one thing for sure that definitely would be would be good and, uh, you know, again, ultimately, though, we'll see what comes of it and what, what plan they decide to, to take on that. Drug. Yeah, it sounded like you wanted national pharmacare. It's kind of the general gist of what I got out of there, something that farm. Yeah, they want, they want national pharmacare for sure, but there was a whole other, different component to it um, that, you know, again, was, was focused on those drugs that are 
hard to get. I mean, I, I don't remember the specific language off the top of my head that they used, but there was a specific piece targeted to that, which would be completely separate from, from Pharmacare. So Trudeau had promised a new direction for the company or uh, country in this, in this speech, a new plan for Canada. But to me, it really didn't seem like there was anything new there. It seemed like it's it's the same things he's kind of been harping on this whole time and has never ever actually done or even worked towards accomplishing. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, like I said earlier, a lot of it is just recycled talking points from the, either the last throne speech or just they're just reannouncing funding or talking about funding that they've already announced and rolling that into this throne speech, right? There wasn't this big, bold, new agenda or idea that was worth shutting down Parliament for, right? I mean, because they prorogued it and, you know, they, they had, what, six weeks to prepare for this. We were expecting something big, some, you know, big fireworks on this. And, and there were, there was nothing really that was like that, right? It was all, um, you know, the typical liberal agenda per se, but, uh, you know, there was no big fireworks again that was worth <laughs> shutting down Parliament for six weeks. Yeah, it felt like he was kind of just going through the motions and that was it he didn't really want to put any real effort into it when it was he was the whole reason why the throne speech needed to be done so to me instead of wasting all of canada's time maybe he should have put some more thought into it and and uh followed through with some things that he's been promising um what does this whole thing mean for canada in terms of of this speech like, wh what direction do you see us taking, and how is it going to affect the rest of us? Anything with this speech? Yeah, I, I think, you know, again, they're going to keep trying to go forward on the green recovery, right? I mean, that's that was still kind of at the forefront of, of it, right? You know, they're, they're committed to seeing what they can do to, to help people get through COVID with financial supports. They're, they're extending the wage subsidy through till I think it was the middle of 2021. Um, so there's there's a few things like that that they're that they're using in the throne speech to uh, get to to make those supports last longer, right? Um, but ultimately, there was no vision for how the economy is going to restart, how we're going to get. They talked about creating millions of jobs. Well, there's no vision for how you're going to create those millions of jobs, right? And uh, without that short-term plan, I've said this a few times tonight, short-term, medium-term, long-term plan, you got to have that. And there was nothing of that sort in this throne speech. I think you're exactly right there. Is there anything that would uh, affect Western Canadians specifically in terms of um, either the economy or any of that, like either positive, negative? Yeah, I think when you would... Going through it, listening through it all again, I mean, it, it's what were the things that were left out, right? There was there was just a very, very subtle mention, again, of, of the role that farmers play, the, the role that our ranchers play, that our energy sector plays, right? It, it was mentioned, but it was, it was just like a, a half a sentence here or there kind of thing, right? There was no, like, firm, concrete plan for those parts of the economy, for, for our region of the country in particular, to just really be like, you know what, this this is the key driver going forward to how we're going to restart our economy. None of that existed, right? So the things that were left out are, are very telling where the government stands on a lot of things and uh, just their, their overall perception of these issues that matter to Western Canadians. Yeah, to me it felt like the territories and uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, it felt like we were all just kind of left out of it and he was going to focus on on Ontario and, and Quebec and BC and that was kind of going to be his focus, um, was my take on it anyway. Uh, so I know you kind of said you didn't, you didn't think you guys are going to support this speech. Um, do you think that that's going to lead to a non-confidence vote? Uh, there, there, I think there were enough tidbits in the throne speech that I think that the, the NDP can support it. Um, Jagmeet Singh himself, though, said that, you know, throne speech is just words. We'll, we'll wait. We want to see a budget. We want to see a, what the fiscal plan is. And uh, so, I mean, when he uses words like that, it makes me think that they're going to vote in favor of the throne speech. Uh, so e even if the Conservatives, if we vote no, if the Bloc Quebecois 
oh no, it doesn't matter because if the NDP vote yes with the government, this throne speech passes, right? So with that in mind, I, I don't think that it's going to bring the government down just yet. Um, but again, we'll see what, how the government handles that. If they have a strategy that they're trying to use, what it looks like, we'll see. Yeah, I thought we normally would have a budget by this time of the year. I know COVID's kind of delayed a lot of that, but to me that seems like a pretty uh, lame duck excuse for <laughs> for not having one by now, considering all the time we've we've really had. Yeah, well, and for businesses to apply, you know apply for a lot of the supports, they had to prove their financial. They had to give a, a full financial report, basically, on what, what their finances look like. Well, the governments can't even do that, so why are they demanding that of businesses, right? Yeah, good point. It's like, come on. Um, so do you think maybe we can expect a spring election? Uh, yeah, it's hard to say for sure. We'll see. I think the government, you know, when, when, you, when you compare now to the spring, now it makes more sense for the government to try to trigger an election as opposed to in the spring, if you're just to take those two timelines. Um, because in the spring, the, the bill on all these, on, on the CERBs, people that owe taxes on that, that's going to be coming due. There's going to be a lot of repayment that's going to be coming due. Um, so, and you know, as our committees get to start digging into a lot of the different uh, different things the government's spending money on and get, you know, again, back into some of the scandals and things like that, you know, there's going to be more dirt coming up to the surface yet again. So, you know, if you're to look at fall versus spring, it makes more sense for the government to try to have an election in the fall as opposed to the spring, but yeah, we'll see. It's, it's up to them to what they want to do. I mean, they're the ones that rolled out a throne speech that we can't support. Um, yeah, it's their call. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of expected he'd be throwing throwing a bunch of things in there that that people weren't going to to expect um, just based upon a lot of the things I've been I've been hearing um, that are going around there. Um, and I think uh, C CRB is kind of what was uh, triggering in my brain there for the first spring was was going to end up being a, an issue for them. So I'm glad you brought that up, kind of thing, because yeah, people are going to be angry that they have to pay this back just because they got caught red-handed basically for defrauding the government basically out of their money out of our money our taxpayer money yeah taxpayers money yeah um so if you were to to think about either a fall or a spring election uh what would the platform look like for the conservative party yeah ultimately it'll just be about what's you know working for canadians right it's it's trying to you know we want to have a, a vision that's going to unite the country um, you know, our leader, Aaron O'Toole, specifically singled out Western alienation as one of the, the main issues that needs to be addressed, right? Um, so I think national unity is going to be a big part of that, that of, of a campaign, right? There will be some similarities and some differences from our last campaign, right? I think there's things like a national energy corridor, for, for sure, that will definitely be in there. Um, you know, there will be some, uh, you know, again, one of the feet, big things that we're going to be asked about is what our environmental plan is going to look like, right? Um, because we're not going to, we don't support the carbon tax, so so then what, right? So there's there'll be, you know, we'll be working on a few things with with an environmental plan. Um, you know, there's there's great technology that exists in Canada that we're utilizing in Canada that already actually make keeps our emissions low. And if they and studies show those are applied to the rest of the world, then you know those are. They'll bring the global emissions down, right? So those are things that I think that we can campaign on that, that are going to benefit Canadians, but would also benefit the, the global environmental issue as well to show that conservatives actually do care about the environment, uh, right? But it doesn't mean that we have to have a carbon tax that is extremely ineffective and punitive as well. Um, yeah, so I mean, again, like I said, there'll be some other similarities. There'll be a few differences, you know, but ultimately, yeah, it'll be... There'll be a there'll be a there'll be a fiscal plan to show Canadians that we we have a short term plan, medium term plan, long term plan. People want to know how are we going to get the economy going? How are we going to safely recover from from COVID? What's the plan to deal with that? But also balance the economic needs of people and businesses as well. So I think it'd be centered on 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 those principles. Mm, sounds a little bit more balanced for the country. I like that. Um, and I know, speaking of O'Toole, it just kind of triggered something that uh, he brought up right after he got in, um, and that was uh, kind of a shot across the bow of our mainstream media, um, who 
are incredibly biased in terms of the way that they present things, um, ridiculously so at times. And I know with the CBC, especially they, um, CBC or CTV got a buyout too, but uh, they are funded by our government, which O'Toole had brought up as, as a big issue. And I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, whether or not I supported him or not going forward or going into this race, um, I was a big lesson Lewis. I was one of those, but, uh, he was, uh, I did like what he presented afterwards. You know, he kind of brought my, my attention back into, into the conservative realm there. Just, just with, with that, especially what are your thoughts maybe on, on the CVC and the CTV and, and those kind of big issues? Yeah, for sure. So one of the, the issues there, I mean, talking about with with the CBC Heron's plan was centered around the the national like the TV media side. Of it. He, he was hoping to keep his plan would be to keep the radio side of it because um, there is a there, I mean there is benefit to having that that aspect of it, right? But yeah, it's, it's going to be defending the English TV side of it. That that's that, that's the plan. And, and yeah, I mean, at this day and age, if it's it, it should be able to stand on its own two feet. There's no need for it to be so heavily subsidized by by taxpayers and uh, when we see the product that comes out of it um yeah the biases that that happen right it's uh yeah it's ridiculous i think aaron has a, a good plan for that it's it's not a complete wipe them out but it, at the same breath it's yeah I, I think it's a good approach that he has yeah I, the family feud thing really bugged me too <laughs> i know how much money we spent on that i'm like that's just a knockoff nobody actually watches it so it seemed like a bit of a waste of our money um yeah so do you have any other thoughts either on the um throne speech or any other topics that you'd like to bring up before we before we close yeah no just thank you so much for for doing this really really appreciate it yeah you know ultimately um yeah, I look forward to being able to vote on the throne speech. I, I, we've already signaled that we're we're voting no to it because there's 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 just not a whole lot in there that we can we can support, right? And uh, yeah, as as a conservatives, we're we're going to be looking to do everything that we can to help Canadians, right? And and to best serve Canadians the best that we can. Um, yeah, and what what that looks like in Cypress Hills grasslands, right? I mean, again, what are the main things that that drive our economy, that drive jobs, right? It's we got agriculture, we've got oil and gas. Uh, there's you know manufacturing plays a big part in our, our area as well too, and, and and tourism, right? There's just just to name a few. I mean, there's there's a lot of other great aspects to living in, in southwestern Saskatchewan. But those are some of the, the predominant ones, and uh, you know I'm going to continue to fight for those those industries and, and for people that work in there and all the small businesses that benefit. Uh, in, in our in Swift Current and all the other great communities that we have in the riding, um, because they're the backbone of the economy, and uh, so we need to be focused on our small businesses. But we also got to work on those key sectors, like like the energy sector and our agriculture sector, that is such an important part to the to our national fabric, but also to the fabric of Southwest Saskatchewan. For sure. So uh, thanks for coming on here, Jerry. Jeremy. I really, really do appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we can have you back on here after uh, all this uh, other stuff gets voted on and we find out about, about some of the stuff going on. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for, for keeping us in the loop and uh, for agreeing to do this.